you may have heard the um the, the poem by robert frost who died in january 1963 entitled the road less traveled uh, two roads diverged in a wood and i i took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference i have entitled this series of blogs the road less traveled because today in a world of media frenzy even among church circles it is so easy for adherents of the faith to try to be politically correct and to avoid controversy we choose the easy road metaphorically speaking someone who takes the road less traveled is acting independently freeing themselves from the conformity of others who choose to take the road more often traveled welcome to the road less traveled a better understanding of the bible is what we are about what it means to be placed on journey with true purpose is what we are about and the themes surrounding a theology of liberation you would find saturated through these blogs this is the first in a series of blogs on the minor prophets that i've chosen there are 12 of them the lives of prophets in the book of the 12 span a period of more than three centuries from 770 to 430 bc and they, they ministered in some of israel's most tumultuous days the lord had promised through moses that he would send prophets to communicate his word to to god's people found in deuteronomy 18 15 through 22 and and god kept god's promise even as god prepared to bring judgment against israel and judah for their unfaithfulness which had persisted for hundreds of years the specific mission of the 12 was threefold one to call the people to repentance so that they might avert divine judgment secondly to warn them of the judgment of exile when there was no repentance and then thirdly to offer hope for the future as the people returned to the land following the exile this blog highlights the prophet hosea now, 10 years after Amos preached in Bethel, Hosea was to be God's last prophet to the northern tribes of Israel. As some would say, God's last word, God's last warning. And it is a real contrast to Amos's prophecy. It is affectionate rather than accusing. It is wooing rather than warning, tender, rather than tough mercy rather than justice and this is god's final appeal before the 10 tribes disappear so we ought to pay careful attention to it and there is a key word which unlocks the whole prophecy in hebrew and it is a word called keshet uh, it is spelled C-H-E-S-E-D. You see, th there is no English equivalent, of course. Uh, we don't have the Bible. We have a translation of the Bible, and that has certain limits. And they are never quite the exact word equivalents to this word, kesed, in the Old Testament, or agape in the New Testament. There, there, there is not really an English word that communicates these unusual but very beautiful words let me try to 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 fill this out <laughs> meaningfully it is essentially a covenant word it is not something you have for everybody it is something you have for those with whom you have a covenant relationship the most covenant common covenant relationship we have 
uh, today is marriage. So there is a commitment in this word. It, it does mean love, but it's not true love unless it, unless it is law, loyal. The other synonyms that are used in the Old Testament for it are loving kindness or faithfulness. Even faithfulness is used 60 times for this word in our English Bible. Kindness is used nine or 10 times. It means unswerving love, undying devotion. It means one is so committed to someone, you go on loving them, whatever happens. There is an old English word that used to be used. It is trust, T-R-O-T-H. The only surviving example of that word is beside. There is a commitment in it. There is, there is a loyalty in it. And it may be very significant that that word has died because that kind of loyalty has also died. And loving is something without loyalty, something you can enjoy for a bit with someone and then drop. That is not chesed, not covenant love. The opposite of this word is unfaithfulness. So in a church marriage service, there are usually words like keep thee only unto her or only unto him as long as you both shall live. That is kesed, for better or for worse, for richer, or for poorer. It does not matter. There is a, that is irrelevant to the commitment. Now the whole relationship between God and Israel is a covenant love and therefore a chesed. Stay with it for a while. So on Israel's side, the covenant meant loyalty to God's commands. Obedience was their part of the covenant. God's part was to, was to look after them, to protect them and provide for them. But their part was to obey God. But what God was looking for was glad, eager obedience that wanted to live the way that, that, that God wanted Israel to live. But that is what God did not get. They are the happiest group of Jews that I know. They are, they are, when I used to live in Brooklyn, I saw them on a Friday or Saturday morning. They are called the Hasidim. And that is made up of this same Kesed, those who delight in God's law, those who are happy to obey it and not to do it grudgingly as a duty, but who see it as a delight. The longest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 119, is all about someone who delights in God's law. It is, it is, it is great to have this. Well, that is quite an attitude, isn't it? The burden of Hosea's messages are very simple. The Lord is saying, what has happened to our marriage? There was still Kesed on God's side, but not on their side now. What went wrong? It is a simple message that it is torn out of the pain of requited love. It is perhaps the most painful experience in the world to love someone and not to have that love returned. To want to love them and to help them and, and they don't, they, they won't have it. Maybe you have known that type of pain of unreturned love. But the question is, how could Hosea understand God's feeling so well? The answer is that God 
taught him in the school of experience whose colors are black and blue. God often prepared a prophet through marriage and, and gave him a personal experience of the feelings of God. Take, for example, Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah, you must not marry. You must remain a bachelor because you have to tell Israel that God is now a bachelor. God does not have a wife anymore. So Jeremiah had to learn from the loneliness of not having a wife how God was feeling without Israel. And that became his message. Hosea had the most extraordinary instruction in God through an experience here of marriage. It is all in chapter 1, 2, 3, which are autobiographical and various expositions of Hosea have been given interesting titles. Let's, let's take it in its plainest, simplest meaning. He married a prostitute under the command of God. They had three children, at least one of whom was not his and was somebody else's. He brought her home, put her through a period of discipline when he did not know her as a wife, and then courted her and started all over again and loved her. Those are the facts. The names of the children are very interesting. There were three. The first was called Jezrael or Yezrael, which means God sows it. The biggest problem he had with, with that child was discipline, mark that word, a very rebellious, unruly child who had to be disciplined. The second child was a girl called Loru Hammer, which means not pitied. And she was a deprived child. She did not have love from the mother. The third child was Loemi, which means not my people. <laughs> this was the child that Hosea didn't father. She already had another man, his, his wife, Gomer, and this child was disowned. Those three adjectives I just mentioned, disciplined, deprived, and disowned, all summarize how God was dealing with God's people in Israel. And the names of the children are so important. That, that is all in chapter 1 about the three children. Chapter two is about the wife. It is very interesting that there are three things about her, but she was reproached by her own children for what she was doing. Her own children said, you shouldn't do, be doing that, mommy. So, so, so even the children could see what was going wrong and she was punished but she was restored later. There, there are the three R's for her, reproach, requited, and restored. Now, chapter three is all about the husband, Hosea. First, that even when she was faithless to him, he was faithful to her. He went looking for her after she left him with the children. Secondly, he was firm with her. And for, a, pre, for a, a period there, he did not treat her as his wife. He brought her home, but did not share the bed with her for a period. That was the representative or was representative of, of the period of discipline in the exile that God was going to put the Jews through before God restored her. Thirdly, he was feared. There was healthy fear in his wife afterwards. So she trembled and she feared him. 
And that was not a phobia, not a terror, but it was a healthy fear that she had, which would bring respect and loyalty back into her life. Those chapters, one through three, tell the story. From then on, chapters four and to the conclusion, is a message that grew out of that because God had given Hosea the message and now he was ready to go and tell Israel that was how God felt about Israel. So we can summarize the message of Hosea. It is made up of different sermons he preached, different prophecies he gave, all jumbled together so it is not easy to analyze. Nevertheless, we can put it together under various headings, which give us the bones of it, as it were, and enable us to read it with a better understanding. Everything he says centers around these two headings. And I want you to remember this, human and faithfulness and divine faithfulness. It is the contrast between Kesed and the very opposite in the people that forms the theme of his whole prophecy. God's controversy with Israel is this, and God's compassion for them comes out in this. Those are the two words that Hosea uses. God has a controversy with Israel, but God has compassion for them. This is God's problem. What do you do with the people that you love, yet who are unfaithful to you? That's God's problem. It is a real problem. So what we have here is a mixture of divine justice and divine mercy. First of all, Hosea does concentrate on seven sins of which they are equal, they are really guilty. And I want to deal with that. We can tell them that we can call them the seven deadly sins of Israel and show God's detailed knowledge of what is going on. The first is in fidelity. They have become unfaithful in their marriages as well as unfaithful to God. It invariably follows they are guilty of harlotry. They are going after other gods like Hosea's wife after other as she went after other men. Secondly, they are guilty of independence. God's chosen government was in Jerusalem but they had created their own royal line. They had set up their own independent kingdom, which is the essence of sin. We will not have you to rule over us, they said. We will have our own kingdom. And they were in rebellion against God's chosen king in the south. So independence was a major sin. Then there was intrigue. There were lies and deceit. And people were making treaties outside the people of God, getting unequally yoked with unbelievers. There was a whole lot of conspiracy going on, like we have today. People talking behind each other's backs, people going behind each other and making secret agreements. Fourthly, there was idolatry. Hmm. The golden calf. Of Samaria figures large in Hosea's prophecy. The bull was a symbol of fertility and it, and it still is. Then fifthly there was ignorance. When they should have known about God, they did not. They could not be bothered to read the Bible. They did not want to know about God. Feel like this is what is happening in our country today. You know, we have had Christianity here for uh, more than 2,000 years. <coughs> I 
and people do not want to know about it. As soon as a religious program comes on television, thousands of sets switch on, switch off rather. It is very reminiscent of all of this, the idolatry, the ignorance, the immorality, the drunkenness, the promiscuity and the violence. Those were things that Hosea picked out of which was making it less and less safe for people to walk the streets at night in Israel. And finally, above all, there was ingratitude. God redeemed them and they were so ungrateful. There was no thankfulness in them. In a series of pictures which would really stick in their minds, Hosea says, you are like mixed dough. That is when you mix flour with olive oil just before cooking it. Uh, but if you leave it and you do not cook it, it goes rancid and, and it's horrible. He said, that is what you are like. Your passion is like a heated oven. He says, you are like an unturned cake that is getting all burnt on one side and it is uncooked on the other because they used to cook the cakes on top of an iron sheet on the fire let the grill. He said, you are like a fluttering dove trapped in a net. These are the metaphors that he is using. It's a vivid picture language. But then he accuses the four groups of people responsible for this condition. Listen, he says, the priests, first of all, they should know God and they don't. They should be telling the people about God and they don't. Then there were plenty of prophets in the northern part of Israel, but they were all false prophets telling people not to worry that God would not do these dreadful things. That is what the people wanted to hear. And a false prophet always says, peace, peace, when there is no peace. False prophets say, don't worry, it may never happen. <laughs> that is a false prophecy. There were plenty of prophets saying, thus says the Lord, but just telling the people what the people wanted to hear. I, I always have a battle with, with this when people are only wanting to hear fancy words and not to hear exactly what says the Lord in a particular situation. It is so easy for preachers to tell people what they want to hear, to want people to say, what a nice sermon. Thank you much. But God needs men and women who will tell the people what they do not want to hear. That's what the minor prophecy is about. And it is costly to do that. It is a road less traveled. Then there were the princes of this royal line they had set up also were responsible. The other group that Hosea singles out for particular condemnation are the profiteers who, who are, and you have them today, who are making money at the, at the expense of other people who were poorer. That's also happening today. I think it is very doubtful if a Christian can really be into profit and loss, dialectic. A Christian ought to take care of those who are less fortunate. In the exchange of goods, we ought to make sure that there is equity, so to speak. That was what was happening in that day, and Hosea singles them out as the corruptors of society. Now, Hosea says, suffering is coming to you. He says, three particular sorts will come. 
Uh, he said there will be barrenness, there will be miscarriages, women would not even conceive or they would lose their babies. That's pretty tough talk. But God can do that. Then he said there will be bloodshed. Come, come. Well, there will come loss of life, attacks, gun violence in the land. But ultimately, the same as with Moses, banishment from your land. That is the severe side of Hosea's prophecy. But it is not his main thrust, which is that God is still faithful. There, there is a statement in the New Testament about our relationship to Jesus. Timothy 2 and 12. And it says, if we deny him, he will deny us. But if we are faithless to him, he still remains faithful. That might be... <laughs> Lift it straight out of Hosea. Here is the good news. His compassion for them. There is the real heart. This, this is the, the real heart of Hosea's word. And it is when I, I, I read chapters 11 through 14 that I am deeply moved by God's faithfulness. God will punish them. You see, God cannot stand for their professions of repentance. God sent his prophets to warn them of their doom. He did not want their sacrifices. He wanted their love. He did not want their, their offerings. He wanted them to know him intimately. Can you feel God's heart here? That is the love that cannot let them off. He has to punish them. But consider this. From chapter 11 on, when Israel was a child, I loved him as a son, and I brought him out of Egypt. But the more I called to him, the more he rebelled, sacrificing to Baal and burning incense to idols. I trained him from infancy. I taught him how to walk. I held him in my arms, but he doesn't know or even care that it was I who raised him up. Oh, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I let you go? You can't read this without some sense of emotion. And here is the final appeal in chapter 14. Oh, Israel, return to the land, your God, for the, la the return to the Lord your God, for you have been crushed by your sins. Bring your petition. Come to the Lord and say, Lord, take away my sins. That is the kind of prayer you wanted. Not the prayer, oh, he'll get us out of trouble. Plenty of people cry to God when they are in trouble, but they, they don't ask God to take away the cause of the trouble. The book finishes. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. And whoever is intelligent, let him listen. For the paths of the Lord are true and right, and the upright walk among them, but transgressors stumble in them. That is one of the strongest appeals in the whole of the Bible to people who do not want to know about God's love. So then, you may ask, what's the application? How do we apply Hosea today? There is one huge difference, I find, between our situation and that which Hosea, like Amos, spoke and prophesied. And we need to think this through very carefully. In Israel, the religion and the state were one and the same thing. It was a what is called a, a theocracy. 
To be born into the state was to be born into the religion and vice versa. That does not apply in the New Testament. In the New Testament, church and state are separated. And that may be summed up by Jesus' own words. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And so in a sense, we now live in two kingdoms. I'm a citizen of the United States of America on my passport, but I'm also a citizen of the kingdom of God. They are not one and the same thing. They are different. Therefore, we have to be rather careful applying prophecies of the Old Testament to a secular state today. Now we suffer from the complication of the fact that since uh, uh, Emperor uh, Constantine, Europe has tried to combine church and state, and we see this all over. Uh, they try to create a Christendom in which the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man are one and the same thing. So that to be born in some country in Europe, uh, England, is to be born, particularly in England, is to be born into the church and we have centuries of an established Christianity behind us. Actually, that may well cease to be in the future. May I say, the longest word in the English language is, uh, is back on the agenda, disestablishmentarianism. <laughs> Tongue twister. And we may well see the separation of church and state. It could easily happen. And then we would be back in a more New Testament position. When, therefore, we see these prophecies which Hosea applied to both religion and state together. We cannot just take that and throw it at our government. That's rather important. The pattern, I believe, is this. What God said through the prophets to the non-people of God can be used as a prophecy to the government. The inhumanity, the riding roughshod over human rights, the legislation that makes the, the rich richer and the poor poorer, we need to attend to that. There are a whole lot of things in there that we can apply validly, but we must not expect the government to try to make people Christian by law. God has higher standards for God's people than God has for others, and it is a delicate line. We have a shortage, I believe, of Christian leaders, and we should not expect them to establish Christian standards, but they are moral standards, which are known to the conscience of humanity that we can expect and can agitate for. So this is my declaration then from Joshua. These prophets, prophecies ought to be applied to the church. And that is where our prime prophetic message, message should be in the church. It is much easier, I believe, for Christians to point out to the world and say what wicked people you all are. It is very easy to do that. But in fact, I believe that the prophetic word is more needed inside the church than outside right now. And that if the church were what it ought to be, that would begin to clean our nation up. But I'm afraid we are getting known as a church that is all muddled up inside and trying to put everybody on the outside right. When we read prophecies, we do not see an amazing reflection of our society out there, but judgment begins at the house of God. And we have to put those things right inside. 
the house of God before we tell the people in the world how they ought to live. This has been my first blog on the road less traveled. We studied Hosea, and for our next blog, we will be doing Amos. God bless you. You have a great day.